In this presentation, we examine biodiversity in the American West and beyond by looking through the lens of ecoregions, which are like ecological neighborhoods. Ecoregions are the unit of analysis in the Nature Conservancy's Atlas of Global Conservation, and TNC is the source for the data presented in these slides. An area's climate more or less determines what types of plants can grow there. At the broadest level, we can classify the planet's land masses according to the predominant vegetation or lack thereof. There are 16 terrestrial biomes, ranging from snow and tundra to tropical forests. Here's a close-up of the U.S. Much of the interior west is dominated by desert and xeric or dry shrublands, but the higher elevations support temperate conifer forests. California has Mediterranean forests along much of its coast and the Sierra foothills. There's a bit of subtropical forest in the mountains of southeast Arizona and temperate broadleaf forest in Oregon's coastal range. As with temperature, rainfall, and elevation, there is more uniformity in the east than the west. Look, for example, at how many different types of communities are found in California, or how isolated mountains in the Great Basin create little biome islands. There are big disparities among biomes in terms of their level of human exploitation around the globe. This graphic shows what percent of each biome has been protected and what percent has been converted from its natural state. Much more land in tundra, boreal forests, and taiga has been protected than converted, but most other biomes have seen far more land developed than conserved. The authors of this study argue that the ratio of the percent protected to percent converted can be used as an index for a biome's vulnerability. This graphic looks not only at historical losses of habitat in the biomes, but also projects out to 2050. By that time, tundra and boreal forests will still be largely intact, but in most biomes, at least half of their original habitat will have been converted. The biggest losses, as a percentage of the biome, are expected in tropical and subtropical coniferous forests. However, in temperate forests and woodlands, reforestation will lead to a net decrease in habitat converted. This graphic from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment summarizes how various threats have impacted biomes around the world over the past century and the current trends for the driver. The only case in which a driver's impact on biodiversity is decreasing is habitat change in temperate forests, where countries are now doing a better job of managing forestry and other land uses. Overexploitation is only increasing in a few biomes, but it is steady in the others. For all biomes, the impacts of climate change and pollution are rapidly increasing. The U.S. leads the world in the number of biomes and smaller ecoregions within its borders, even exceeding countries that are much larger in size. So it's no surprise that the U.S. also ranks high in species diversity. In this graphic, the blue bars show the number of species that are found in the U.S., broken down by species type, and the orange diamonds show what percent of the world's species are found in the U.S., and the number in parentheses in the labels on the horizontal axis indicate the U.S. ranking worldwide. The highest levels of diversity for several species groups are found in the U.S., including freshwater mussels, freshwater snails, and crayfish. Several other taxonomic groups, such as freshwater fishes and gymnosperms, are also well represented in the U.S. Let's take a closer look at ecoregions, which are a helpful unit of analysis for examining the incredible diversity of species and ecosystems that inhabit the world and the West. A more fine-grained view than biomes classifies the terrestrial world into 825 unique ecoregions. These areas are sort of like ecological neighborhoods with similar habitat. The slides that follow are based on the Nature Conservancy's Atlas of Global Conservation, which analyzes the global environment using terrestrial and freshwater ecoregions. You can see that there are dozens of terrestrial ecoregions in the United States. Here's a close-up of the West. If you were to drive through several ecoregions, say on an interstate road trip, you'd notice the differences simply by looking out the window. The Nature Conservancy's atlas also analyzes the Earth 
according to its 426 freshwater ecoregions. Each of these regions has a unique collection of fish species and other aquatic species, as well as freshwater habitats. Here are U.S. freshwater ecoregions, which generally correspond to the boundaries of important river basins. This close-up of the West shows its two dozen or so freshwater ecoregions. The geographic definitions don't always line up with the boundaries of river basins. The Colorado River Basin, for example, includes the Colorado, Bonneville, Vegas Virgin, and Gila freshwater ecoregions. There are 11 types of freshwater ecoregions in the world. Some areas are dominated by lakes, others by rivers and their deltas. The U.S. is home to a variety of freshwater systems. There are subtropical river systems in Florida, temperate rivers in the midsection of the country and along the coasts, lake-dominated ecoregions around the Great Lakes, and warm water desert rivers and closed basins in the Intermountain West. One way to summarize biodiversity is to look at the evolutionary distinctiveness of species in a given location. This map shows the phylogenetic diversity of terrestrial vertebrates, animals with a backbone. Phylogenetics is a measure of how closely related a group of species is. An ecoregion with high phylogenetic diversity has species that are more distinct from one another. The measure is actually calculated by using something called a cladogram, which is what most people know as the tree of life, a diagram that shows how species have branched out due to evolution. Phylogenetics takes measurements in the cladogram to calculate the evolutionary distinctiveness of species, which is greatest around the tropics. In the west, phylogenetic diversity of vertebrates tends to be highest in the desert southwest. In general, measures of species diversity are greater at lower latitudes due to the past effects of ice age glaciation at higher latitudes and the configuration of landforms on the earth, both past and present. Another high-level measure of biodiversity is the number of species that are found in one area but no other place on Earth, what's known as endemism. This map shows the number of endemic vertebrates by terrestrial ecoregion. Endemic species of birds, mammals, and reptiles have typically evolved in isolated habitats, such as islands. Endemism tends to be greatest in the tropics and in places with many islands. In the U.S., the number of endemic vertebrate species is highest in the southwest and Gulf Coast states. Even arid areas have islands of isolated habitat, such as mountaintop forests surrounded by deserts, that can give rise to endemism. Global hotspots for endemic freshwater amphibians, turtles, crocodiles, and fish include coastal rivers of the High Andes, Western India, and East African Rift Valley lakes. In the U.S., Freshwater endemism is greatest in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. Out west, hotspots include California, Oregon, Utah, and Arizona. The analysis and conservation of biodiversity often focuses on those species most at risk of extinction. This map shows the number of globally threatened animals. Threatened species are those listed by the IUCN Red List as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. Globally, some of the greatest concentrations of threatened vertebrates are in South America and Southeast Asia. About half of the threatened animals are reptiles and amphibians, one quarter are mammals, and one quarter are birds. In the U.S., the southwest, the foothills around California's Central Valley, and the southeast and Appalachians have the most threatened animals. The number of globally threatened freshwater mammal, bird, and crocodilian species is highest in the lower Amur River in northern Asia, the lower Piranha River in South America, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Irrawaddy Rivers in southern Asia, and Indonesia's coastal rivers. There aren't many globally threatened freshwater mammals, birds, and crocodilian species in the American West just a handful along the Southern California coast. Let's take a closer look at certain types of species. This map shows the number of plants by terrestrial ecoregion. Worldwide, there are more than 420,000 of the so-called higher order plants, trees, vines, grasses, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. 
Deserts and arid lands typically have fewer plant species, while tropical rainforests have the most. But in North America, some drier parts of the inland west actually have more plant species than wetter climes along the coast. Compare, for example, the Great Basin in Nevada to Washington State. The number of mammal species, shown here by terrestrial ecoregion, is highest in the rainforests of Amazon, Asia, and Africa. Mammals tend to do better in warmer climates, though even polar regions have their share. For mammals, the greatest number of species is in the inland west, and highest in the archipelago of Sky Island mountain ranges in southeast Arizona and southwest New Mexico, plus some higher elevation areas in west Texas. The greatest concentrations of freshwater mammal species are in regions with tropical forests and lots of flowing water. In the U.S., most areas have between four and eight freshwater mammal species, but there are upwards of 20 in the Pacific Northwest, parts of the Midwest, and along the eastern seaboard. Birds are found in virtually every terrestrial ecosystem, but more than one-third of species have been documented in Central and South America. Other hotspots include the tropical rainforests of Africa and Asia. With birds, the diversity is highest in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, with many tropical and subtropical species at the northern extent of their ranges. There are more than 800 freshwater bird species in the world. The East African wetlands have the greatest diversity, with more than 150 species. For freshwater bird species, Texas has the most, but virtually all parts of the country have at least 60 species. The number of amphibian species is highest in warm, humid climates, including the Andes, Brazil, West Africa, and Borneo. For amphibians, the southeast U.S. has the greatest number of species, and an especially large number of salamanders. There aren't as many amphibians out west, but there are still plenty in places that aren't especially wet, such as the Colorado Plateau and Mojave Desert. Scores of amphibian species have already gone extinct, and scientists consider them among the most endangered types of animals. This map shows the greatest number of threatened amphibians are found in the headwaters of the Amazon, in rivers and wetlands in South America's Andes, and along major rivers in southern Mexico, India, and China. Many amphibians around the world are threatened. In the U.S., Texas has the most. There are three to seven such species in California, Oregon, and the Four Corners states. Scientists believe a number of factors are at play in the decline of amphibians. This graphic color codes the declines according to the key in the lower left. In Asia, where there are many blue dots, the decline is primarily due to the overexploitation of these animals, whereas in Europe and the United States, many of the population decreases can be attributed to habitat loss. But in Central and South America, Australia, and parts of the U.S., the decline is still enigmatic. That is, habitat conditions are generally good and the species are not being overexploited, yet their numbers are shrinking. Another major factor in amphibian declines is the spread of the chytrid fungus, which has been linked to local and global extinctions. The number of lizards and snakes is especially high in the tropical rainforests of Mesoamerica, Africa, and Southeast Asia. As you might expect, the number of lizard and snake species is highest in Arizona, New Mexico. The number of turtle and crocodilian species is highest in warmer, more humid ecoregions, such as the southeastern U.S. and Southeast Asia. There aren't many crocodiles outside of Florida, but even in drier areas such as the southwest and northern plains, there are plenty of turtles. The greatest number of fish species are found along large rivers in temperate and tropical regions, including the Amazon in South America, the Ganges in India, and the Yangtze in China. In the U.S., ecoregions around the Mississippi and its tributaries harbor many freshwater fish species, in some cases five times as many as in western ecoregions. This map shows the number of migratory fish species by freshwater ecoregion. Japan's salmon and the Amazon's catfish help make them centers of fish migration. There are more than a dozen migratory fish species found in the Pacific Northwest and many parts of the East, but such species are relatively rare in the Great Basin in Arizona. This map classifies freshwater ecoregions by the degree of disruption of fish runs. Dams are the primary impediment to migratory fish. 
There are nearly 80,000 dams in the United States, and virtually all ecoregions have seen their fish runs significantly disrupted. In the west, the problem is especially bad along the Columbia and Colorado rivers, both of which have major hydroelectric dams. Non-native species are one of the greatest threats to native biodiversity around the globe. The number of harmful species that have invaded freshwater habitats is highest in the temperate ecosystems of North America, Europe, and Australia. Virtually all of the country also has at least some harmful invasive species, with the greatest number found around the Great Lakes and Northeast. The slides that follow describe marine ecoregions. You can download more slides and other resources at ecowest.org.